America's clashing culture war. That's the topic of today's Bold and Blunt. And I'm your host, Cheryl Chumley, giving you a Christian conservative look at today's news, politics, culture, and events. Look around America right now, and what do you see? You should be seeing more than just political opposition. This runs deeper. What's taking place in America right now, the angry rhetoric, the vicious attacks in the street, the takeover in the streets by so-called protesters exercising their First Amendment rights. This is all deeper than just political dissent. It's not political dissension that we're seeing on display. It's outright spiritual warfare. It's good against evil. It's evil rising up because evil thinks its time has come. And in many respects, those of good natures, those of Christian upbringing, have indeed allowed evil to sprout and spread in America because they've become too silent, complicit even, in the growth of evil. And before I get into more of that, I want to quickly mention, if you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app at washingtontimes.com, where please go to the bottom of the page, the newsletter section, click on it and find Bold and Blunt with Cheryl Chumley. Sign up for my three times a week newsletter, comes out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, right to your email box, as well as my twice weekly Tuesday, Thursday, Bold and Blunt podcast. You won't be sorry, but you will be informed with the truths you need to fight the far left. But you may also get Bold and Blunt at Real Life Network. That is the faith-based news arm of Pastor Jack Hibbs out in California. And you may get Bold and Blunt wherever podcasts are offered. Before I get into more of the cultural battle taking place in America, a quick mention from a Bold and Blunt sponsor. If you look at the news today, which by the way, that is exactly what we do here on Bold and Blunt. But if you look at the news today, all you see is a financial landscape growing more and more dangerous. And I, for one, am frankly concerned about anyone, including myself, who has retirement funds. Stubborn inflation, soaring interest rates, astronomical debt. These are all things that drain the value of our retirement dollars. And to make things worse, the government is now even targeting 401ks and IRAs with heavy new taxes to pay for, get this, social justice agenda. The good news, though, the good news is that there is one little known strategy that can protect your financial future. What is it? I'll tell you. I'm talking about the gold IRA from American Hartford Gold. This gold IRA strategy, it can shield your wealth from this economic devastation. And the best part is, this method is tax and penalty free. We all know that analysts predict gold is set to hit all-time highs, right? So if you have retirement funds that you cannot afford to lose, and who doesn't, now is the time to call the only precious metal dealer out there that's trustworthy, American Hartford Gold. And how do I know this is trustworthy? Well, they have five-star ratings from thousands of reviews, and an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau. And if you call them, they'll show you how to protect your savings and your retirement accounts by diversifying your portfolio with physical gold and silver. And get this, tell them I sent you, and they'll give you up to $5,000 of free silver on your first order. That's amazing. So call them now. Call 866-525-4680. That's 866-525-4680. Or text BOLD, B-O-L-D, BOLD, to 655-32. Go bold for gold. Again, 866-525-4680 is the telephone number. Or just simply text the word BOLD to 655-32. 
if America was founded on the ideal that individual rights come from God and government is only there to preserve and protect those rights the citizens already have, which is something that I deeply believe, so much so that I talk about it almost every Bold and Blunt podcast episode. But if that is true, then to keep God-given individual liberties in play, alive and well, alive and kicking, you have to keep the God in that equation. Remove God from God-given and what do you have? A big empty space that, oh, here comes government, ready, willing, and oh so happy to fulfill that role. Government wants to become the God, right? Government wants citizens to rely on government. That way, government can control the citizenry. Politicians love it, love it, when the people beg them for entitlements, when the people beg them for this and that and that and this, because then the politicians get these big ego boosts as if they're the ones giving out this and they're the ones that deciding who gets that. Unfortunately, government doesn't make something. It doesn't create anything. It only feeds off of what the free market makes and provides. And so government must constantly take from one to give to another in order to keep control of government powers. So America without God, America with closed down churches, thank you, Anthony Fauci, coronavirus, and the cowards who shut their churches oh so quickly because a government bureaucrat told them to. A America without churches, an America without a thriving, believing, faith-filled citizenry is an America fast-tracked toward secularism, which is fast-tracked again, by logical extension, to bigger government, meaning socialism, meaning communism, meaning Marxism. This is why America is where America is right now. This is why Americans have lost so many individual God-given liberties, because this comes from Barna, right, which is one of the leading polling and research firms for spiritual matters, for faith-based matters. 69% believe God exists and is the all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect creator and ruler of the universe. That's decent, right? That's decent data about the younger generations in America, which this survey deals with. But 36% believe that as a sinner, the only solution to the consequence of sin is to acknowledge your sins, ask God to forgive you through Jesus Christ, and rely on him to save you from those consequences. That means the vast majority of the younger generations do not believe that they have to turn toward the heavens, turn toward the creator, and receive forgiveness for sins. That opens the door to humans believing in the power of self, right? If you don't believe you're a sinner saved by Christ and in dire need of constant forgiveness and grace from the one who went to the cross to die for your sins so that you may have everlasting life, if you don't feel that need, then what you do on earth is kind of it. It becomes your decision if something is good versus evil. And as the Bible teaches us, we all have hearts that are deceptively wicked, right? None of us are good. All of us need a creator, a heavenly voice to tell us, to dictate to us, to make it clear to us what is good versus evil. That's why we have spiritual gifts called discernment or prophecy, right? Or even knowledge and wisdom. These are things that come or that should come from above. When they're gifted properly, they're rooted in biblical truths. But when they're gifted improperly, they come from the evil one, and they come in the form of self-pride that says, I don't need no stinking Bible to figure out what's right versus wrong. Well, this is why America, once again, is where we're at on the cultural decay on the scale of cultural decay. And I have a guest with me today who has written a book 
called Endangered Virtues and the Coming Ideological War. That's a mouthful and that speaks volumes. And that's what Michael Phillips is here to discuss. Michael, thank you so much for being on Bold and Blunt. It is so great to have you here. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Um curious about the premise of your latest book, Endangered Virtues, and the coming ideological war. Do you predict civil war on the horizon for America? That would probably be a stretch. Um, I raised that in the book, and honestly, I, I mean, if you're talking about a real war, I don't know. Some people think that's the way it's going. I, I have my doubts. I don't predict really anything in the book, but we're already in an ideological war, and it's a civil war, but a war of ideas, a war of thoughts, a war of outlook, um, and I don't think that's a secret to, to anybody. I mean, you've written about that in, in your books, too. It's an outbreak of violent arms, one side against the other, who knows? Nobody can predict the future, but boy, we're in an ideological war, that's for sure. It, it, it is a stretch to think that America, after all these years, right, of just, you know, peaceful elections and the parties may have disagreed, but in the end, we all wanted the same thing for America, uh, for America to succeed, it, it is a stretch to think that it could ever come to the point of just mass violence in the streets, but it just seems like we have seen so much violence in the streets in recent years in America that we never would have predicted even that happening. Yeah, and the more you pay attention to history, things come back around, and it's, I agree that it's not maybe out of the question. I mean, people are are the same as they've always been and in when even World War II, I mean now it seems a long time ago, but who would have predicted that so in such a recent modern sort of sophisticated age such awful things could happen, but when forces align and they're held with such passion as the ideas are now, exactly like you say, wow, I don't know. Yeah, no, nobody wants to predict that, but <laughs> it's important, I guess, not to be blind to the potential that, you know, despite this is America, it, it actually could happen. I've seen things in my short lifetime, not so short lifetime, let me uh, let me amend that, <laughs> but, but I've seen things just in my lifetime that, you know, 20 years ago would have shocked me, so. Um, no, and. And, you know, really, this is another thing I say in the book. I mean, it's it's obvious to the most casual observer, but it's still a major point. All wars do begin with ideas and conflict over ideas. And, and the ideas tearing us apart now are just so deeply held, and they're, they're visceral. And those kind of idea conflicts... You never know where they're going to lead. Well, from a Christian perspective, which I'm speaking from, uh, and I don't know how you want to address that, address that, but you did talk about values and virtues uh, as being sort of the fuel to this fire that we're facing in America right now. From a cr Christian perspective, it almost seems uh, like revelation times, but people hesitate to say that too, because throughout human history, there have been times that have been way more violent than what we're seeing in America. Yeah, that's true, and I I sort of back away from from uh, getting too apocalyptic about it. Um, you know, I I grew up in the '60s, and I heard Hal Lindsey speak before his book came out, and the whole futuristic, um, apocalyptic, second coming fever that came in waves through the evangelical church in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and then as Y2K approached. I mean, I've been there, done that, heard it all, seen it all in a way, and so I, I tend not to interpret events now in that light just because 
there have been there's so much so much water under that bridge in my lifetime that I tend to see it different. I don't discount that, that that's a possibility. I mean, the Lord's going to come back one day, and uh, who knows when that'll be. I tend to see things in a little more long-term, long-range perspective, and that's why I, I focused on ideas and values and virtues and all of those things in the book. And this is no doubt what makes your book so compelling. And I have to admit, I haven't read it yet, but I've read through um, bits and pieces. The, the idea that we need the Christian roots of this nation to once again come to the surface and take priority as a means of pushing back on some of the chaos we're seeing. That really is the root, right? Yes, and um, I try in the book, I think this is really important, and we, we've seen this in the last couple of elections, too. It's not just a Christian message. The, there is a, a linkage between Christian values and simply American values, and they're, they're pretty much the same. And so I speak in the book about the alliance, if we we put it in <laughs> put it in war terms of war <laughs> the alliance that is going to be necessary and is already really i think we see it between christians who value virtue for spiritual reasons and simply americans who don't profess spirituality of any kind yet they believe in the same core virtues and standards and traditions that are important to them. And that alliance, I think, is where the ideological, um, that's, that's an alliance that will shape up in the ideological war. Agreed. So let me ask you this, because I know that you probably track polls and surveys about the trends of America's belief in God, the trends in Americans' uh, church-going habits and so forth, the faith of our youth. And so as you see America growing more and more secular, how concerned are you that that's going to impact the ability of this alliance forming and, and bringing about any success? very concerned that's the nutshell right there right <laughs> yeah yeah the, another point i when I, I talk about the two sides sort of in the ideological war and the one side is traditional thinking um, americans and you would have to say traditional maybe thinking christians and on the other side the progressivism of secularism there's no no, it's no secret there, but there, there's a huge groundswell of converts to that progressivism that are coming from the church, and they're, but they're not believing in the core, in my opinion, at least. They would, there would be a lot of disagreement to this, but in my opinion, that alliance of Christian progressives is losing sight of the scriptural foundations of true Christianity. So you're going to have Christians and secularists on all sides of this thing. And that's why it's hard to, to talk about it in spiritual terms only, because it's a lot bigger than that. Yes, it's the, the message, Jesus would be a socialist, the, the sort of social uh, justice gospel that has entered many of our churches. And I understand that this has happened at points before in America, but combined, the, the degradation of biblical teaching that's based in truth, along with the growing secularism in America, would seem to show this nation facing a peril like no other time in U.S. history. Am I, I am I totally wrong? I totally agree. I totally. I read a thing, an AI. Uh, you you probably saw it. It, w it was horrifying to me. Uh, rewriting of scripture of the woman caught in adultery from some AI source. It was horrible. It was just 
how Jesus would would support and condone things that uh, I would say are not scripturally based, and that pastors were interviewed. Yeah, this is the real gospel. This is Jesus would certainly believe in this, <laughs> yeah. and that's where we're at. And it's horrifying. I am very concerned. Jesus would tell her, "Just wear a condom. You'll be okay." Right? right. That's, the, that's the AI way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and I, I'm sure you've seen the um, the couple of churches that have actually tread deeper into AI waters and allowed a sort of technology driven. Um, head to 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 preach in, on Sunday services. Did you see that? No, that's a new one to yeah. me. Oh man! <laughs> so <laughs> that's a road we probably don't want to go down. Oh my goodness! So so take taking into consideration all that, then the the good news would seem to be that a lot of youth on college campuses in America are rising up and having a lot of just worship services on their campus. I know, and they're being they're being persecuted for it, but good for them. I mean that that baptism service at at Auburn and so forth. I mean, oh yeah, there's good signs. I mean, the the more intense this ideological war becomes, sides get taken, and it's it's frightening where it may be going. But a lot of it's also forcing a lot of people to wake up and what's going on among young people, it is great. And it may not be a majority, but, you know, a a few seeds planted can grow. So what what sort of words of wisdom do you have for parents raising children in this really wicked society, sending their kids to public school where they're put at risk of facing LGBTQ agendas? How to instill virtue and moral righteousness in your youth? That's that's really a hard one because, and I talk about that in the book too, but, you know, if you haven't walked a mile in somebody's moccasins, you're, you're, you know, your advice is cheap. My wife and I homeschooled all our sons all the way through, and that, that began in the 70s and 80s before homeschooling was, you know, we were kind of afraid of the knock on our door and they would take our kids away, but we did that. And I think the obvious, the obvious answer to that is get your kids out of school. Do anything but let them go into that cesspool of, of terrible things that are being taught. But everybody can't do that, and I recognize that in a way that's cheap advice. If you can't do that, I don't know what parents should do. I think that's the first line of of defense. Get your kids out of school, whatever it takes. But if you can't do that, then you have to fight the battle on a different front. And and that's hard, but you you just better be really strong and grounded in instilling virtues and courage in your kids. The kids are so afraid to buck the norm, and who wasn't? We all were. When kids are are timid, but I think besides instilling virtues, it's important to instill courage. That's a good point, and yeah, I, I think parents have to be vigilant what's being taught. But it, the the children who don't have parents who can homeschool them. Parents can actually strengthen their kids uh, to do to better to better equip themselves to do effective battle because they'll if they go to public school and yet they come out of it with their virtues intact they'll be better equipped than those who perhaps were only homeschooled and haven't seen and withstood the fire from evil so far. It, sure, and that's 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 really true. I think maybe the change that needs to happen within in in Chris, with Christian parents is I mean for years generations it was just assumed schools did the education parents put the food on the table and that was, there was kind of this division of labor and that's that was just the way culture operated and that's the way parents thought and I think 
concerned parents have to completely reorient that to I'm I'm part of this show. I've got to even if my kids are in public school, I better be setting the the anchoring foundations. I I've got to to supplement that strongly, powerfully. It isn't that, that division of labor can't exist anymore because if that if the schools are still just let to be in charge of everything, the kids are going to be lost. Absolutely. And let me just wrap with this one um, general question. From your book, Endangered Virtues and the Coming Ideological War, what, what, what is the basic theme or takeaway you'd like readers to draw from it? That's such an obvious question. You'd think I'd have an answer at the tip of my tongue. It's hard to put it into, into a, a, a sound bite. In one way, I had to write it for myself. So in one way, my takeaway was simply what I was saying to myself after years of, of not speaking out culturally, and my writing was in other directions, but I just reached a point in my life where I had to take Martin Luther's advice and say to myself, here I stand. I'm, I'm not going to be silent in the face of all this anymore. And maybe that's the takeaway I hope people receive from the book, too, that within themselves... Virtue is important. This is important. The culture of wars, we should understand all these trends. But each of us have to go into that place within ourselves and say, here I stand. And here's maybe what I'm going to do about it. And some people, everybody will do different things. They will respond differently. But I think too many people haven't faced the reality of this tidal wave that's coming at us. And I just realized I needed to face that for myself. And that's what began the book. And I guess I hope that's what people take away, a sense of personal look in the mirror and say, who am I? What do I think about all this? Where do I stand? And I think God honors that, right? I, I, I do think he honors that. And I think sometimes when one person takes a stand and says what needs to be said fearlessly, it wakes up other people who realize, hey, I'm not alone in thinking this or just talking about, about it around the kitchen table. There are others out there who think similarly. And it sort of energizes the battle. So... Uh, Good for you, Michael. I I really appreciate you taking the time to chat on Bold and Blunt, and best of luck with... Thank you. Thank you very, very much. And uh, you've just, you've kind of pushed a few buttons and forced me to think about some new things just already. (laughs) (laughs) It's too early, too early in the day for that, but (laughs) I appreciate it. Endangered Virtues and the Coming Ideological War, Michael Phillips. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. If you like Bold and Blunt, you may get Bold and Blunt at edify.app, at washingtontimes.com, at Real Life Network, and wherever podcasts are offered. And one more quick mention, if you have retirement funds that you're counting on that you cannot afford to lose, American Hartford Gold has a five-star rating from thousands of reviews, an A-plus from the Better Business Bureau, and... If you tell them that I sent you, they'll give you up to $5,000 of free silver on your first order. We're talking physical gold. Call them now, 866-525-4680, 866-525-4680, or text BOLD65532. I want to thank you for listening. Remind you, if you like Bold and Blunt, subscribe to Bold and Blunt. Why not? Why miss any episode at all? Have it delivered right to your email box. And tune in next time. In the meanwhile, don't forget, stay blunt, stay bold.